recording is on. Okay, so to uh, reiterate, please note that all our meetings are recorded and made available to the public for viewing on our YouTube channel. By participating in the meeting, it is understood that you have accepted these terms. And that's it. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our meeting. Um, so tonight, I don't think there's anybody new here. I don't see. Nope. Nope, that's it. And Marty's here. Welcome, Marty. So tonight, um, I am going to do a uh, a presentation on toroid basics. I think I think I, this is going to be like the fourth time uh, that I'm presenting this since I joined the club. Um, it's backed by popular demand, so I'll go through that. Um, and then Dave's going to uh, have a show and tell of his latest project, the Curve Tracer. Then after that, we'll have uh, time for uh, uh, Q&A uh, and anything you're working on. And if you've got anything to show. And I think we're covered. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing my screen here. I hope I get this right. Um, Let's see. Share After which... three years, you better get it right. Yeah. Sharing. What do I want to share? I want to share my entire screen. There we go. And... Where is, okay, see my screen? Are we good? Yeah, yep. we're good to go. We're good. Okay, let's get started here. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, back to popular demand. Um, I've done this uh, thing about three or four times now. And basically it's just Torre basics. And I know there's people out there who have done a million toroids. You know, you calculate your turns and everything. But I thought I'd go over this again. Uh, and uh, anytime through the presentation, if you have a question or a comment, put up your hand. And uh, Peter, if you could uh, watch the hands going up, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, I can try and do that. Now, be warned, I, I do have to take off a bit early. So uh, we'll, we'll go. With, we'll see what happens. Yeah, okay, okay. So, toroids come in many forms, but we're mostly familiar with the uh, circular ones. Um, there's all kinds here, circular ones, rods, uh, binoculars, uh, some uh, uh, SMTs, all sorts of them. They even come in uh, as uh, axials. So what are toroids? toroids introduce permeability that that means and it increases your inductance for a, gi a given number of turns um toroids as we're used to seeing is uh they like donuts and it even has the donut hole and they come in different diameters thicknesses permeabilities and types depending on the frequency range of interest um there's two uh, uh two types one is the uh, powdered iron, and the other one is ferrite. So here's some uh, ones that we're, we're probably all familiar. We got the, the regular circular ones, binoculars. These are beads. They're usually uh, put in lines uh, on um, uh, components like transistors or frets to knock down VHF parasitics, uh, clamp downs. Uh, SMT mounted, and then usually your USB cable will have a, a, a toroid of some sort on there for uh, killing RF. Oh, wait a minute. What happened to my... Uh... Oh, my text went off the screen. Okay. Okay, some of the advantages of toroids are 
high inductances for the physical space they occupy. So uh, the space that these toys take up is much more compact than probably an air core would be. Uh, there's no interaction or coupling between adjacent components. Um, unlike the, the air wound uh, cores, um, if you have a component next to it and you go to adjust it, you could uh, alter the frequency if it's in a tuned circuit. Um, and it's advised not to lay the toroids down on the PCB, especially when there's a ground plane because it will interact with it. Um, if there's two toroids that are close together, put one at right angle to the other <clears throat> and there won't be any any uh, interference. Uh, they come in uh, different permeabilities and they have exceptional Q values when wound correctly and the uh, optimum core and winding selected. So for example, what the, I don't know what this says here. I don't know why it went off the page. Oh. Um, now, when it, when it comes to tuned circuits, the, uh, the FT series, and we're more familiar with the 3743, 5043, um, these have very poor Q values, so they can't be used in tuned circuits. And then there's a wide range of... Uh, <clears throat> of uh diameters and thicknesses they're they're pretty inexpensive you know if you go buy a lot from uh diz at kits and parts you might get 10 of uh, a particular size for like five bucks um often simple to secure to the board and they're self-shielding Disadvantages, nearly impossible to in, introduce a variable <laughs> tuning of the inductance. Um, so there's no way of actually uh, tuning it unless you make a PTO like Frank did with uh, the glue the uh, glue stick. So basically you're moving a toroid inside a coil. And uh, it, it's subject to uh, thermal drift. What the heck happened to my pages here? Let me start this one over again. I don't know what's going on. Um, no, I don't know what happened to it. Anyways, different differences in use of the powdered iron and the ferrite. So, uh, iron powder or dust has a low permeability, um, low inductance factor, but it has a very high Q. They're typically used in in uh, tuned circuits. So your you know your T fifties, T thirties, those ones, the ones with the T's are the ones that you you will use in a tuned circuit circuit. Ferrite cores have high permeability, high inductance factor, but they have a very low Q factor. Um, they are typically used in impedance matching. So if you're going to go from a uh, um, from a uh, RF amplifier or from a mixer into a not a mixer, yeah, from an amplifier into a mixer, a dial mixer you're typically stepping from 50 ohms up to 200 ohms. And that's where you'd use the FT uh, uh, series uh, toroids. Um, what the heck? Iron powder. Oh, I must have missed that. The iron par powdered uh, uh, ones. If you shoot a high current through it and it overheats drastically, when it cools, it's undamaged. Whereas with the ferrite ones, any uh, really high uh, currents through the uh, the windings 
will uh, overheat the toroid and it'll damage it permanently. And uh, do not use ferrite for tuned circuits because of the low Q. So never, you know, if you've got an LC circuit, don't put an FT in there. Use a T. All my pages are off. Oh, Q, Q factor. The Q factor is the uh, dimensionless uh, parameter that tells us how close we are to an ideal inductor. So for real world, inductors uh, have some unwanted resistances. What the heck happened here? Oh, my Lord. I was just looking at it. It was fine have unwanted resistance associated with them. So there might there's going to be some resistance in the windings. This unwanted uh, resistance can be due to factors uh, such as uh, DC resistance can affect radiated energy and core losses. If you realize the equivalent circuit of an inductor, it consists of an inductor with a series resistance. So here we have a coil, and this is the resistance that's built into the coil. And this represents what a, an inductor looks like. Um, we have Q, so we got the reactance of the core divided by the resistance and uh, where, the, where the reactance of the coil is two pi FL. If we substitute, we can figure out what the Q will be of that, uh, of that inductor. Oh my Lord, what happened to everything here? I'll have to fix this up. Um, Q indicates the energy loss is relative to the amount of energy that's stored within the system. When currents flow through an inductor, an inductor opposes the flow of current with, with some resistance. Lower the resistance, higher the quality of the uh, Q factor of the inductor and better performance. One important point to note is that the higher the Q, the narrower your 3, uh, 3 dB bandwidth will be uh, uh, narrower. So if you have a very narrow uh, bandwidth and you need to um, uh, widen it up, you can introduce some resistance to uh, a tuned circuit. But of course, there's going to be a, uh, some loss in there. And I don't know what this... Okay, yeah, so here is your bandwidth. So the high Q one has a very, uh, very high, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, attenuation, whereas the low Q one, uh, it's not very good. And the 3D points are going to be different. So how do we calculate inductance uh, in a toroid? Well, the number of turns is equal to 100 times the root of uh, inductance over the uh, permeability factor, AL. Um, and then you could rearrange the formula to get your inductance. So if you know... If you took a, a toroid and, and wound some wire on it and you knew what the uh, permeability factor of it was, you can actually calculate by hand what the inductance is. Um, here's a chart of uh, different um, powdered iron uh, uh, toroids. Here's the uh, sizes here and uh, the different mixes. And these would be the um, permeability factors for these toroids, for these different mixes here. And in this chart here, um, it labels what the mix number is and what color code is on the actual.
actual Torah. So usually you'll see one side of the Torah would be colored yellow or red or whatever it happens to be. Uh, this is the material type that's used. And uh, I believe this is the actual measurement. And I don't care about this stuff here. And this will give give you this column here gives you a frequency range that's going to uh, it works with, and then some uses um, for the different types of mixes. So if we actually took this formula, and uh, we want to make a uh, a five micro Henry. Uh, inductor on a T68-6, they, uh, the uh, permeability factor for for this type of Torah is 47. So if we put in the numbers, we get 32, 33 turns. And, but uh, I don't know how many people, probably just about everybody of uh, gone and used uh, this is uh, Tory calculator sheets so if you actually go to uh, to a site here's this site here if you go down to uh, toroids so this is what he has available um, so like here uh, what's a good one t52 t56 so for 25 pieces six bucks american which is pretty pretty good as far as i'm concerned now if you go and had what was my example here oops t68 six so if we actually go to if you go and click on here it's going to take you to the data for it so um, this section here is if you want to look at a different Tory, but right now we're on the 68.6. Um, this is a 25, uh, 25 hundredths of an inch outside diameter. And this is the mix type. So number 10. Uh, permeability factor 4.7 color code yellow and typical uh, frequency ranges 3 megahertz to 40 megahertz so if we wanted to um, figure out what we want so what our example we had what five micro henry's and uh let's try seven megahertz and see what it comes out to you calculate 32.6 turns so it's pretty pretty uh pretty good and uh all the other types if you click on them it'll take you that to that right you can do the same thing put in what size you need frequency that you're going to work and it'll give you the turns ratio um and also what this has done is to um, put calculators here for uh, matching uh networks between two different impedances so if you want to go 50 to 200 ohms this will calculate what your inductor and capacitance will be So a typical, a uh, typical uh, scenario is RF is coming into a mixer and typically the input is 50 ohms. The other side would be typically 200 ohms. Now, if you've built uh, any of the bid axes, the earlier ones, uh, Farhan's uh, turn ratio would be, um, he typically used 10 turns trifiler where one turn is the input and the other two in series would be the output. 
but to actually calculate this. What we want to do is we want to go from 50 to 200. So what we do is we start with the, the lowest input. I heard a hand go up. Yeah, Ken. Yeah, David, like. Yeah. 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 Ken, could you just, what you said about forehand and the trifiler? Because, yeah, I do see he does a lot of uh, trifiler windings, but it looks as if one, one of the windings he doesn't use. Well, uh, well, I've I've built two of his bid axes, and uh, any situation where he had there, where it was one winding on the primary and he had two windings on the uh, secondary, um, the one pair would be the input, the other two in series would be uh, the secondary, and he just wound them trifiler, so ten turns. So then the this the like so you got three pairs of wire, two are connected, the end of one is connected to the start of the other one to make it yeah. windings. So you get double the yeah. windings. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. got it. Check. Yeah. Okay. And you gotta watch out for the, the phasing here. So if uh you know what what you do is you sort out your windings. So one end of the toroid you'll have your inputs the other end, you have your outputs. So you take one input, find out where the output is on the other side. That would be your primary. And then for the secondary winding, if you find uh, you take one of the input other inputs, find out where the output is on the other side, take that output and connect it to the third input. So now you've got two windings in series understand okay so uh i don't know if i have a picture of one like maybe not but anyways uh we what we want to do is we want to calculate uh, our windings here so what we do is you start with the lowest uh, the lowest impedance input. So this will be RF. Uh, uh, this will be in in ohms. So we'll start on this side. Now uh, a lot of this stuff I've learned about toroids came from uh, Wes Hayward. Um, if you notice here, uh, what he says to do is to take your uh, Resistance multiply by 10 for your reactants at your lowest frequency. This um, will be used and a uh, value used in the calculator. So basically, um, he said to take this, this impedance multiply it by 10 for your reactants. So now we're going to have 500 ohms. So what I want to do is I want to transform 50 ohms to 200 ohms. So we'll use uh, a 3743. So to go to uh, where it is here, FT3743. Here we go. So I want... 500 and it's going to be at my lowest operating frequency which is going to be 7 and we calculate so it says use 5.7 turns round it up to 6 so we're using the, his calculator and we've punched in 500 ohms at 7 megahertz. And since our impedance ratio is the square of the turns, um, the impedance ratio is 4 to 1. So our turns ratio will be 2 to 1. So at 7 megahertz, 500 ohms is 6 turns. 
if we calculate the turns ratio, our now our secondary is going to be 12 turns. So on, on the primary, we're going to have six turns. On the secondary, we're going to have 12 turns. So if you wound uh, three, uh, three windings to a filer, six turns each, one pair would be the input. The other two pair in series would be the secondary. And that's how you would step up from 50 ohms to 200 ohms. Um, and uh, that's what I have here. Six turns truck filer. Or what you could do is take two, you can wind um, your secondary first, a, a total of 12 turns, and then you could wind your primary on top of that. It'll give you the same result. Either way works. And I think that was it. I heard a hand. Go ahead. Yeah, Charlie has a question. Go ahead. Where does the 200 ohms come from? That would be uh, what's uh, needed on the mixer. And and how do you know what that is? Like, is it with experience? There, there. If you do, uh, if you do a diode full bridge diode mixer. Mm -hmm it's typically going to be 200 ohms. Okay. But if it was 500 ohms, then uh, the, uh, the the ratio will still work out. Go ahead. Yeah, it's Al here. Um, just a little bit more on, I guess, was that Charlie's question? I struggle with knowing what the impedance of devices would be. Um, I can see how you can do the transformation, but I, I would never come up with that 200 ohms. Uh, is, is there a, a reference or a table of typical components? Uh, I guess I've seen like from basic uh, transistor amplifiers, they usually tell you uh, the one has a high impedance, low, out, out, low output impedance, et cetera. Um, but I really do struggle with uh, finding what the uh, impedance I'm trying to match might be. Uh, any thoughts where I would learn that or? Uh... Um, a, uh, a good person is to look at, what's our buddy oh, oh, in New Zealand? Um, Charlie Moore? Yeah, he does a lot of this stuff and he has, he actually records it and he'll actually show you the calculations and everything. And there's uh, quite a few, uh, quite a few uh, videos he has where he's actually calculated a transformer to uh, step up or step down to what he needs. Um, I don't Basically, like with, with the diode uh, mixer, this is typically what it is. It's usually 50 to 200 ohms, typically. Um, for an actual uh, SBL1 or, or 80, 81, um, you'd have to find out what the, uh, what the impedance is on. on the, actually, no, that's already done for you because they've got coils inside. Huh. What was his name again? Charlie, last name? Charlie Morris. Morris. Charlie Morris. He's got a lot of videos and a lot of uh, instructions. Um, he'll actually uh, sit there and he'll calculate stuff out and he'll do it on paper so you can see what he's doing. Great, thanks. His, 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 his call is ZL2, ZL2 CTM, Charlie yeah. Kemp Tango Mike. And yeah. he's he's really good. He's got a ton of stuff there. Yeah, a ton that's of stuff. where I've learned a lot of stuff. Yeah, unfortunately, he's been away the last two or three months uh, working, so he hasn't put anything up uh, new lately. Thanks, but even his even his old stuff, like 
when he starts doing a new project, he'll actually figure out his amplifiers and impedances and everything, and he'll show it on paper how he did it. He's a very good resource. Dave's got a question for you, Ken. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it was a, more of a comment to Al. Al, one of the things you could do if you want to know what the impedance of these circuits are, is LT spice. If you model this in LT spice, I've modeled uh, diode ring mixers in LT spice, and it works out perfectly. You could see how it mixes, see which diodes are turning off and on. And in LT spice, you can actually measure what the input and output impedance is. So you don't have to go and calculate it. You can actually measure it. Good tip. I'm going to have to bone up an LD space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to retire. <laughs> actually, it's not, it's not that bad. I've actually built, um, I haven't done it for quite a while. I don't use it all that much, but I have actually built uh, bandpass filters in it. And I'm able to tune it in uh, LT Spice, and then I take that and I actually build the circuit. And it, it works pretty darn close to what the LT Spice uh, says. I guess when I retire, I guess I can start learning things like LT Spice. I got nothing else to do in my life. <laughs> <laughs> um. Great using it around a around a swimming pool in Florida in in February. What's that? It's great using LT Spice around a swimming pool in Florida in February. Yeah. Somebody want to kick Peter out? <laughs> um, this 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 stuff was a lot easier to explain when we had uh, uh, face to face meetings. Because uh, we could do it on the uh, board, and I could show you what uh, how you actually go through the uh, calculations. So that's the end of this one. Uh, oh, I've got another one here. <laughs> Forgot about this one. So here's some of uh, your common, common toroids that you'll see. Um, these two, remember, the FT uh, series uh, toroids, never use them in tuned circuits. They won't work. There's some regular uh, uh, powdered iron, binocular, and some more uh, ring type. I think this this is the type you would get from Diz because they're not uh, his stuff doesn't come color coded. How come this one didn't screw up? So what is the inductance coefficient AL? It's the self-inductance that is generated in units of the winding of a coil with a given shape and dimension. So again, here's the formula. And uh, if you're so inclined to do it by hand, do so. Go here. It does the same thing for you automatically. So we show a chart. So we have a sample. Um, I want a 2.28 microhenry at 7 megahertz. Now, um, when you say 7 megahertz, if this toroid is going to be used at many frequencies, you want to use the lowest frequency that you're going to be using. So if you're going to use in 7 megahertz and 14 megahertz, use 7 megahertz. And again, as I explained, you could uh, punch in your values, give, give you a turns. So 2.28 uh, microhenries was 22 turns on a T2510. Well, in this case, T686. And as I'm sure we've all wound uh, toroids. So basically what you want to do is once you've calculated what your turns are going to be, just start winding. And basically what you want to do is you want to 
uh, fill up three quarters of the torate. And of course, if uh, there's so many turns that you can't leave this kind of spacing, so be it. It doesn't matter. The reasoning behind this is now you have flexibility of adjusting your inductance slightly higher or lower by squeezing the turns together or spacing them out more. And then once you have your uh, toroid wound, next thing you want to do is you want to strip this enamel. So there's different ways of doing it. You can uh, scrape it off. You could uh, burn it off and then use some uh, emery cloth to clean it off. Um, there's some that will actually melt with the soldering iron. But ultimately what you want to do is you want to get your enamel stripped off just below the toroid. And uh, once you get it uh, cleaned off, Use a piece of emery cloth to uh, clean everything off. And then um, uh, and then the next step would be to tin, tin the wires. Now, the reason, one reason, or most important reason to uh, strip the enamel close to the toroid is um, if you leave too much on and you actually push it through the hole, you'll have some of the enamel sticking through the hole and you get a, a cold solder joint on the other side of the board and on the top side of the board. And here's the same tori, it's all turned. So I've got it stripped off just near the bottom here. You wound that? And, yeah. Holy, holy guacamole, it's near perfect. I can do these things in my sleep. I've done so many. And I think that's it for this one. Yeah. Um, what else can I say here? I think that's basically it. Can any uh, comments on using binocular cars when, when you do when you would use them? Um, you'll see them you usually used on the uh, finals. Um, what you want to do is what's happening behind that is the, uh, uh, the inductance factor for binoculars are really high. Um, so what you want to do is you want, you want to try and keep your turns down, uh, as low as possible. So, you know, like a particular binocular, for example, may have uh, space in the holes, say six turns of a particular size. And it, uh, if you need 12, 12 turns, well, they're not gonna fit. And uh, you could actually go to another size if you need, uh, need to pass more wires through. Um, I've used them on the input of uh, uh, receivers because I needed to keep the turns ratio down. And uh, uh, with the toroids, the actual circular toroids, the donut toroids, a turn is when the wire passes through the center of the toroid. With a binocular, your wire has got to go in one end, out the other, and then turned back through again on the other side of the toroid. I wonder if I have a picture here somewhere. Okay, so so the, for for a turn on a, a regular toroid, it's when the wa the uh, uh, wire passes through the center. So you take your, your wire over top the toroid, through it, and then back out the bottom. That's one turn. Um, with a binocular, what you do is you enter the hole, come out the other side, double back, and come through the, that second hole. That's one turn. So the turns, 
the term fashion is different between the two. And typically you'll see this on uh, the, in the finals of a, of a transmitter or transceiver. Anybody else? Yeah, Ken. Um, uh, Al, I asked um, Rex that exact question the other day. Eric was over here and we had a call with Rex and I was asking Rex, Rex about that. And what Rex, Rex said is that if you look at the material, that's a great picture there. If you look at the amount of ferrite material in that binocular core, there's a lot more ferrite material. There's a lot, lot, lot more material. So it can, it can hold a lot more magnetic field. So the wire going yeah. through it generates more magnetic field and that and that um, it's got more surface area, it's more stuff to hold the field. So therefore it can carry a lot more magnetic field, a lot more current, and it doesn't get saturated as, as quickly, hence they're used more for high power applications where you you be generating a very strong magnetic field and you've got you need more of that ferrite material to hold the magnetic field and yeah. that kind of makes sense yeah. yeah it does plus the the binocular the, the material type used on binoculars is different than used on the regular toroids too it's got a higher uh, uh inductance factor on it too Anybody else? Any questions, comments? Go ahead. Unfortunately, I can't see who's putting their hands up. I think that it was Marty. Marty. Go ahead, Marty, unless you're uh, muted. Now I can't see uh, see who it is with uh, my presentation up here while I'm sharing. Anybody else? One more question from Al. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, you talked about saturation, and um, uh, again, I guess there's references as to uh, how much power you can put in these things. Uh, I've heard some people just say, you know. Try it and see if it gets too hot. You need a bigger one, but uh, it's got to be a more scientific way to uh, uh, determine uh, how large a, a toroid you, you want. Whether it's going to be a, a three eighths, a half, or something up, uh, you know, with the order of a, a one or a two two point three uh, inch. Um, how, how do you really uh, select the size for for this term they call saturation? Um, is it just tables and calculations? I've act, well, I actually I wonder if it has it on here. Power transformer suppression. Yeah, Ken, he's mm -hmm. got um, he's got a link to the actual manufacturer's uh, website, and it's got like a, a data sheet, and that data sheet has got the maximum magnetic field that uh, a toroid can handle. There's somewhere on here. I stumbled across it. And he's got like it's from uh, Amadon or from the, I can't remember the other manufacturer makes toroids, but there he's got a link where you could go to the. It may not be on this page, it may be on, on a different page, but he's got a link to the uh, to the actual um, uh, manufacturer data sheet. Fairlight is that one? Yeah, Fairlight mm -hmm. and, uh, and Amadon. But he's got an actual link where you open up the uh, the PDF that describes all their mixes. Oh, okay. I can never find it. Why? Well, you need it. Yeah, I can never. I've never. I've looked for it here, too, and I haven't seen it. Uh, but there are charts out there, Al. Uh, I've actually seen them um, where you want to... Uh, uh, you pick your uh, wattage that you want to use, 
plus a factor, an overhead factor too, and it'll recommend which which size to use. Um, I might have links somewhere in my bookmarks, but it'll take me a, a couple hours to go and find them because uh, I have so many links in there. But there are charts available. Even outside of uh, this stuff, I've, I've found right. charts. <clears throat> Anybody else? Oh, okay. Oh. So I guess we're done. Okay, I just I'm thought I'd show a book here uh, again. This is a reprint from MFJ. And it's, um, who is the author? This is from uh, Doug DeMa. It's got a lot of good information in it, but uh, I have to admit it, I, I haven't read it cover to cover as well, but I've started going through it. So, uh, again, thank you for your presentation. It's uh, I've been blindly using these things and uh, without really knowing why or how they were selected and just hoping for the best. I haven't let the magic smoke out yet, but uh, it was probably just a matter of time. Yeah. So, so thank I, you. I've never over, overheated a torrent at all. Uh, and I'm sure that book he's got, he's got to have charts in there about uh, power, power, power ratings for toroids and binoculars and whatever. But I know that for a fact there's charts on the, on the internet. I've I've used them and I've looked at them. Uh, someone else had their hand up. Oh, maybe not. Okay, cool. Any more questions? Okay, I guess that's it. All right, guys. Um, you know what? If we ever, ever in the future meet face to face. I'll, exp I'll explain in more detail and a, a lot easier to explain how to calculate your turns ratio on a blackboard or a whiteboard or whatever. Because I remember doing this presentation uh, previously at Simon's office and he's got two whiteboards up there and I was able to show everybody how it actually worked. Um, it, it's difficult to explain on a piece of paper. Okay. Well, Dave, you want to kick it off? I have a question. Uh, another question, Ken. Okay, go Before ahead. There you go. Have you thought, you know, the um, 10 times factor where you multiply the, uh, we you multiply the, you want this to be 10 times the 50 ohms. Where does that 10 times Y? It's just um, somewhat it arbitrary, to, I guess. Yeah. It, Chris it has talks. To, uh, it has to do with the actual, not the impedance, but the actual uh, reactance of, of the core or of the uh, toroid that you want. Now, he didn't really, uh, Wes didn't really explain what this 10 times factor is, but I've noticed that uh, on other sites, uh, people were using twice, some were using four times, some were using eight times. There was even one guy using 20 times. Charlie uses, I think, five. If I, I, I remember looking at that, he uses five times, yeah. I think. Okay. Seems to be very I'm arbitrary. Using, yeah. I'm using 10 because that's uh, what Wes recommended doing at the time. Mm -hmm. I, I've had a, a lengthy discussion with him about these things. Actually, it, it came up with his, um, uh, what do you call it, the Hikus, uh circuit that he designed with, uh, is it Rick? Using uh, the J310s. Um, and uh, that actually works quite well. Okay, thanks. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, Dave, take it away. Okay, 
Yeah. Um, so no, I just wanted to to give a little primer. Where is? Geez, where did I put my? Uh, oh, here it is. Here it is. So I uh, just a, a teaser. I've done a presentation up, and I'm uh, going to be showing this um, at our next meeting. And I just wanted to give a teaser for what I've uh, what I've done. So uh, you can see my screen. So I built. Uh, I took my uh, curve tracer. And I moved it from this, right? I moved it from that to this. So, and uh, I just ordered, um, I just sent away the board to JLPCB to get this board uh, done, but it's a version two of this board. So the interesting thing is, um, my version two of this board, which I've sent to JLP, JLC PCB to do, I designed that using this board because that board's got a whole bunch of, it's got about six transistors on it. And all those trans, transistors I biased and I, all the calculations were based on the data I got from this board. So, which is, you know, pretty cool. So just wanted to kind of show you, um, just give you a little bit of a teaser of what's to come. Now, I hope I don't uh, mess up the recording here. So you guys can see my screen? Yeah. Yep, no problem. So here's kind of the schematic of it. Okay, it's, it's uh, using a nano, and it's got some circuits to generate uh, a collector voltage, and it's got another circuit to generate a base voltage, and I sweep it, I measure it, and I'm able to generate some plots. And uh, the types of plots I generate are like this. So I could generate, I can calculate the beta of the transistor as I sweep collector currents. So I get, could get a beta versus IC. And you'll see people doing calculations saying, oh, use a beta of 100. Man, are they wrong. <laughs> like beta varies quite a bit depending on what current you're, you're feeding to it. Here's beta versus IB. So this is the base current. So depending on your base current you're feeding in, you may be getting a beta much lower below 100 or your beta might be well above like 150. And that's why the data sheet gives a range of beta. So what I did was, and then I could generate uh, uh, like a VBE versus IC, VBE versus VCE, that, and then you could see where it uh, reaches saturation. Uh, here's the classical you know, transistor plot where you're plotting uh, IC versus uh, VCE. And so in my presentation, what I'll do is I'll go through, like for example, measuring the forward voltage of a diode. So here, you know, the data sheet says it's one volt and the calculation I get says it's 1.6 volts, which is pretty close, pretty good. But I'll be doing like, here's this for a Zener the Zener, the, the uh, Zener voltage for a 1N752 says it's 5.6 volts and the data sheet saying it's 5.6 volts. Pretty good, you know. And, uh, you know, I'll be going through various transistors and I'll be categorizing them and you could see right where it's reaching saturation. And you could see what the saturation point is and you'll see what region you could use the transistor in to, in a linear operation. And you'll see uh, uh, beta, and I'll compare the values of beta to what the data sheet says. And I do that for a bunch of uh, transistors, and then I do it for a bunch of MOSFETs. And with the MOSFETs, you could you could definitely see where it turns on and turns off. Well, not turns off, but it 
goes into what's called triode mode, where it stops uh, being a linear, uh, being an amp amplifier and being more of a switch. And, uh, you, you know, they, they use something called millisecs or Siemens, uh, something akin to beta. So this calculates uh, your Siemens as well. You could do a plot of uh, a GM, G subscript M versus ID, you know, and so forth. So, and then I'll, I'll go into what my version two of my transistor uh, tracer looks like. And you can see it's got three transistors for each. Uh, um, this is for the collector voltage. And here it is for the base voltage there. So there's six transistors and all these transistors, they were all biased. All these calculations were based on data I got from version two of the uh, transistor tracer. And the other thing is I'm using a uh, ZIF socket because in version one, I'm using these, uh, just these uh, uh, pin header sockets, which are terrible. So anyway, that's all I kind of wanted to say. Uh, I just wanted to give a teaser of what's coming up um, in that talk. Anybody have uh, comments, questions for uh, Dave? Good one, Dave, good one. Okay. Um, I just thought of something too that uh, what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to make a video and I will show on paper how to calculate these uh, toroids. And uh, I'll post it. I'll give it to Dave and he can post it on the YouTube channel. And you guys could uh, take a look at that as well. And that way you understand. Instead of seeing numbers on a white page there, I could explain a lot a lot easier uh, doing it with a video. Alrighty. Uh, so, uh, what's next here? Does anybody have any show and tell? Or if they have any questions regarding anything that we deal with? Or you want to share something that uh, you've been working on? No. Uh, just one question. What, what's the name of our YouTube channel? Uh, Sorex. Okay. Actually, I wonder if... Uh... Yeah, I got it. Thanks. Oh, you got it? Okay, good. Maybe you could post a link uh, in the chat. Okay, Howard. We'll catch you uh, next month. Yeah, we'll see you later. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, in regards to the uh, DCR project, uh, I do have it working. The only thing I have to do now is uh, work on the bad pass filters. Uh, Dave is going to ma be making a second uh, uh a revision to the existing board uh to fix up a couple of little boo-boos but other than that uh it's basically ready to go um what we had planned to do was to use uh qrp labs bandpass filters um i've got a i've got one put together but i haven't actually tuned it up or actually used it on the dcr and hopefully I'll get that uh, working. And once it's uh, all working and it works with Dave's new board, then we can go to the next stage of uh, planning the Bellathon.
Oh, there you go. Dave's got it up. Yeah, I just thought I'd show it in case someone has some uh, questions. Actually, I can show. I've got the board beside me. Um, this is the uh, change version, Ken, with the through hole resistors and the uh, yeah. block reversed and all the other stuff you needed to get done. Yeah, okay. So I don't know if you want so How to big's the board? Or if anyone's got questions about it. So is it looking. mostly is it mostly through hole, Dave, or is it? Uh, looks like a, a fair number of uh, surface mount stuff as well. Yeah, just there's a limited number of uh, through hole, mainly the the capacitors. It's all like twelve oh six, right? Which is fairly it twelve oh six is not too bad to work work with. I find uh, once you get down to smaller than that, it becomes a challenge. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. 12 6 is, is, is not too bad to work with. Looks like fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, mostly I've got, everything. I've got, a, re sure, I've go got a reflow station I should be able to do that with, I think. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a question about doing this. I, I can imagine that if you, uh, if you do a design, so you figure it out sort of in LT Spice or whatever, and then you then you use uh, uh, the schematic program to, or you lay you lay the keycap to lay the board out and so on. I can imagine that you must you must make one board and hope it works. Send it off and hope it works, or do you like how do you make sure before you send it that it's going to work? You have to do re work really carefully, I guess. Well, Dave, Dave did uh, um, print out or the uh, board layout, and Peter and I checked it, and uh, there was mm -hmm. a couple spots where um, that we missed. So that's the main reason we're getting a second rever uh, revision done on. Plus, there was a couple other things, little minor things like the volume controls operating in the wrong direction. Um, uh, for the uh, uh, local oscillator input, um, I'm using the Park SigGen. And if you actually look on Dave's board there, there's a, an attenuator, a, a Pi attenuator being used. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that not everyone is going to be uh will have the sig gen uh to use they may end up using a, a uh, signal generator they may have some other source uh like a dds of some kind uh so the option here is um you can either uh, adjust those resistor values for the amount of attenuation you need <coughs> or uh, by shorting out uh, that resistor that's directly below the SMA. If you short out that resistor, then there's no attenuator in the circuit and you can use an external attenuator of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, I could short out that resistor and I have a step attenuator to use. So I could feed the SIG gen through the step attenuator and uh, uh, figure out what value I need of a attenuator to uh, to use. Um, the data sheet for the uh, 602, 612, uh, they're recommending between, what is it, 200 and 300 millivolts at the peak. And uh, I was having an issue there for a while uh, but we figured it out. And uh, that's what I'm getting right now. I'm getting uh, 220 millivolts peak to peak. And it works quite well. 
especially for the amount of parts on the board. That was Michael that asked but, that question, uh, right? What's that? Was that Sorry, what, was, that asked, what was that, Dave? Was it Michael that asked that question? Yeah, he was asking if it was uh, all SMT, SMD or SMD. Yeah, no, he was asking the about the, the fabrication process, right? So yeah, yeah, I can I can see that you might end up having to make a few tries at it, possibly. Well, well here's you know I use the Santa Claus approach. Okay, you make a list and you <laughs> check it five times. You got to check it like I just sent yeah. a board. I just sent my um, transistor tracer board to the fab uh, to the fab house to get it done, and I must have checked that at least about a dozen times. You got to keep going and checking mm -hmm. it, and you check it and check it and check it, and you know I check, I go through, and I'll go through the actual schematic, and I'll trace through, I'll trace everything mm -hmm. through this the the schematic, go through all the pins. Then I'll take the data sheet and I'll pull up the data sheet for like the SA and I, you know, everyone knows the data sheet for the SA612. You know, it's pretty straightforward, like uh, the ins and outs, but I'll take it and I'll just double check the pinouts and make sure I've got the pinouts connected correctly, see what they reference for bypass caps and so forth. And I just go through and I check everything. One of the key things I do is I also check the power here because like, for example, you got six volts feeding this 10 ohm resistor with a 100 nanofarad, 0.1 microfarad cap here. That's a low pass filter. So it's, it's, it's filtering out any noise on the line. So I'll take that and I'll put it in LT spice and I'll, I'll run that through and make sure I'm getting appropriate attenuation of any noise on that line. So, and then same thing like mm -hmm. with the uh, the LM386, I'll go through and I'll, I'll double check, especially polarities of the caps, right? You gotta make sure you got the polarities in the right direction, you know, cause these, uh, these elect electrolytics, they get quite angry if the, uh, if the um, polarity is wrong, right? They can get uh, quite snarky. I blew up one the other day. It didn't, he got quite angry. That elect, electrolytic really voiced his opinion why he didn't want to have his polarity reversed. That happened to me as well once with, a, with an electrolytic that was wired backwards and it just exploded. The top came off, the the top with the cross came off and the the paper just spewed out. It was quite 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 entertaining. Yeah, and the other thing, oh, the other sure. thing I, I used to is I use the uh, electrical rule check. It's for the schematic. It's pretty primitive. It's basically looking for a unterminated. Like if I, uh, I I have a connection that is not terminated, I have an open, I have an open connection, and you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if I do electric rule check now, it's going to complain about that pin not being terminated. Saying that pin is not, well, not, not terminated, it's not connected. Right? So it, it'll mm -hmm. do things like that. It'll catch things like that for you. That's why you got to take these, uh, this uh, termination, this not termination, this uh, um, marker and you mark it as a, uh, not connected. So this is telling, you know, Kai, Kai, Kai CAD to ignore that rule. Don't apply that rule to that. And you see the, the message goes away. So there's that. Mm -hmm. And then on the, um, the PCB board, same thing. There's, this one is a lot better. This is, if you fail something here, chances are you're going to mess it up on the uh, board coming out because they check a whole bunch of things. They check the, I uh, see this has got no errors. They check the spacing between traces. They check the overlap. So if you've got a, if you've got your um, silk, silk screen and it's overlapping another, um, 
uh, it's called a cart courtyard. If it's overlapping, it's going to puke and complain. See, it's saying sil silk screen overlap. It's mm -hmm. telling you where it is and it gives you a marker, right? So it, you'll catch a lot of things mm -hmm. like that. You'll catch things like if the spacing, this is too close. See how it's got a spacing here? That's the spacing that the fab house wants. Mm -hmm. And so if you get your pad closer than that, it'll complain. And I'll say, this is not good. It's too close. So you could do all things like that to um, prepare your board. So when you send, send it away, uh, it's done well. And you know what? Bottom line, Michael, the boards like today, I ordered five boards with six bucks to get, including shipping, yeah. six bucks. Nine dollars Canadian to get five boards. It's like you, you just can't beat that that price, it. right? Mm hmm Yeah, go ahead, Marty. Where's Marty? There he is. I think he's having Are you muted? Uh Is he muted? I can't see. Dave, are you still sharing? Nope, I turned off my screen. Oh, okay, that's weird. It is. Okay, go ahead, Marty. My screen is saying it's being shared, but it's being shared to record. So I don't know if you're seeing a okay. record message, something sharing for recording. Now, if you're talking, Marty, we can't hear you. Maybe you should leave and come back in, uh, Marty. Or uh, maybe you can type in comments. Uh, I don't even know if he hears us. His camera's off. Okay, you're muted now, Marty. Unmute. Talk which means there is some audio issue. Yeah, maybe your uh, mic's not hooked up or something. Or you can type it in the uh, chat box there, Marty. Yeah, at the bottom of the screen, Mark, Marty, there's a little uh, bubble, a, a little bubble, like a cloud bubble, a cartoon. Uh, if you click on that, it opens up a chat window and you could type in um, what uh, you, you'd like to say. He's asking what the frequency range is of the receiver. Oh, uh, I've only tried it on 40 and 20, uh, but it should work on the rest of the bands as well. Oh, there you go. Okay. I didn't see his message come up. No problem, Marty. Yeah, Marty, that's why the uh, receiver's got a bandpass filter. And uh, we had talked about using Hans Summers's bandpass filters because they're all pluggable. So if today you want to use it on 20 meter, you just plug in a 20 meter bandpass filter. And then you'd need to, um, we, we were planning to use the SIGGEN. So you just use the SIGGEN. Uh, get it to go up to 20 meters and you'd be able to like uh, tune in signals on on that band so you'll just need the only limitation is your oscillator and your band 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 pass filter that's the only thing that's gonna uh, limit your frequency let's see if I can get this to uh... let me hang on a second here Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. That looks, yeah, that okay. looks good. Yeah, it's reversed. Uh, 
so what you guys are seeing on the top left is the uh, power input uh, to the left of that or right of that is the uh, um, oscillator input or sig gen or whatever you want to use to the right of that is the bnc for the antenna um, to the right and down is a bandpass filter that's just a, a one uh, a very simple one i'm using now it's not the qrp labs one um, below that and to the left you have to move is, it is uh, volume control we're on we're on that but uh three quarters of the board you have to move it over a little bit yep right there perfect that's better yeah that's good okay so top left power in sma for your your sig gen or lo input the bnc for the antenna to the right side of the board is a bandpass filter the headers are spaced for the QRP Labs bandpass filters, or if you want to make your own of some sort, which I did there, uh, it, it works. Uh, to the uh, bottom, to the left, is the volume control, and on the far right is the audio jack to a speaker. Um, so if you actually look on there, besides the connectors, there's not really all that much on the board. Uh, mostly everything is uh, SMD, except for the electrolytics, uh, the, the uh, full-size ones. Just below the uh, uh, the SMA connector is the input attenuator. So with the SigGen, um, I've got a uh, 18 dB attenuator on there, and it supplies... Uh, what did I say? 220 millivolt peak to peak to the uh, uh, 612 or the 602. Six, 612 and the 602 are exactly the same chip. I found out a little story that when uh, uh, Signet was manufacturing these years ago, they were marketed as the, um, the NE602. Um, uh, Years later, they decided to um, uh, drop the product uh, and uh, do an updated version and call it the NE612. The only difference is, is that the uh, operating temperature was a uh, uh, military spec. And uh, for some reason, people started sending them emails. Why are you dropping the 602? Blah, 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 blah. So what Signet did was they, all the new chips uh, were all 612s. But they took half their uh, production line and, and marked them as 602s. And sold them <laughs> to the people. Yeah, had them fooled. The data sheets are exactly the same for both. Exactly. Uh, I've actually, on this board, I've actually used a 602 and a 612. And they both operate exactly the same way. One of the things we should uh, so, maybe have a, just a quick chat about, Ken, is uh, who's interested in this. Because one of the things we were talking about uh, the other day was, you know, how we're going to fund this. Because previously, you know, we'd... Uh, uh, Frank would do a lot of this himself. He would he would pay for this out of his own pocket sometimes. Sometimes he'd get, get some money from Park. So we don't have that luxury anymore. And um, so we were, one of the things we were thinking about is we'll order based on who wants the board. Because the board's not that expensive if we order it in quantity, right? But we just have to place place an order. You know, before, you know, when Frank used to do this, we would order like 50 boards or 40 boards or 60 boards and just absorb that cost into the cost uh, per board, right? And then, um, you know, provided to members at the build Build-a-thon. So in this case, I'm not sure whether there's going to be a build-a-thon or if people are going to want the board themselves. So that's one of the things we have to talk about or think about is 
you know, how we're going to fund this, who wants it? Is this something people are going to want? And before your answer, before you answer this, just want to make a mention that, you know, others have said this in the past when I was a newbie in this group and they're hundred percent right. And, uh, uh, you know, they said that having a receiver is one of the best pieces of test equipment you can have in your shack, because if you're generating RF, even if it's an oscillator and you've got a receiver, you put that receiver near your oscillator, you could still pick it up. So that receiver becomes a very important piece of test gear that you could have. If all else fails, you could use that. Right. So, you know, and you could use it to, you know, listen to things, have fun, be the life of the party, take it out at the next Christmas party and start you know, tuning it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, when uh, when do you want to know? Because um, I know that I want one, at least one. Daniel wants one. So there's there's two, maybe three there so. When do you want to know? I well, guess you need the money up front, which is fine too. I can do that. You know what? Like I've been working with Frank since 2012 on these builds on kidding and everything. And, you know, like Frank would uh, pay for stuff out of his pocket and then collect it at the end of the build a -thon. I've done the same thing too. You know, like part of the SIG, the uh, part or the SIG gen. Um, I paid the whole thing out of my pocket and then I collected at the end. It wasn't that expensive. And with the DCR, it's not going to be that expensive. So far, I have the cost down to $24, not including the board and not including the bandpass filters. 24 bucks is not bad. You add in a little bit of tax, the cost of DigiKey delivery, you know, like it's going to be like 30 bucks. And the, yeah, it's going to be the boards. The boards kind of going to be, they're going to be like a buck or two at most, a buck yeah. or two board, right? Yeah. And for the cost, you know, like it's not that expensive. You know, if we ordered 20 kits, I'll pay for it out of my pocket and I'll, I'll collect it at the end. It's no big deal. Now, the SNA that we built was a totally different story altogether. Because I think that was running about 120 bucks a kit. And there was like mm -hmm. 30 people or 25 people. Uh, we actually uh, approached Park for a uh, upfront cost to get everything going. And then uh, at the end of the bill uh we returned the money back to uh, the executive. Um Big projects, we're, we're going to have to fund it on our own. We're going to have to come up with, uh, you know, uh, people committing to a kit and paying, I don't know, maybe 50% up front and then pay the rest at the end. Smaller projects like this, I don't mind doing it out of my pocket because it's not that, it's not that expensive. So, uh, once we get the second revision, best works, for you works. What's that? Whatever is best for you works. But, yeah. You know. Yeah. You decide what you want to do, and we'll go along with you. Yeah. 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 Um, but we'll. we'll uh, I think there's going to be, I don't know, 15, 20 people probably interested. Uh, there may be some of that just want the board. Some people. You want the, you know, other people want the whole kit. I can't see uh, not wanting the whole kit because everything comes together. Just put it together, and that's it. It'd be nice, uh, Ken, if if we could kind of launch this because this has been sitting with us now for like two two plus years, you know. And we yeah, right before COVID. Yeah, we 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 ori originally. Uh, put this together because there were several new members who had never built a receiver, built a radio before, and we thought this would be a great starting point for those people. And those people have mm -hmm. since left the group. So, you know, um, so it, it'd be nice that we could launch this and we could move on to another project. 
Because yeah, I'm, absolutely. I think that's where that's. I've been saying that for three years. <laughs> yeah, uh, one of the problems was uh, uh, design. There was no. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? No consistency. Uh, design. Uh, design there, collaboration. There, I would say there was no consistency uh, in the design. I'd 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 soften yeah. it and say there was no consistency. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a that was that's <laughs> yeah, that was most of the problem. Yeah. Was getting a board layout done. And uh that's been uh uh solved uh, a little while ago with Dave. So, anyways, uh, so, I, I don't know. Maybe we can put a, put up a poll and uh, see what people would say. What I what I want to do, if I get this first revision done <coughs> in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to make some videos of it in, in uh, action, and uh, I'll get Dave to post it up on the uh, YouTube channel. You guys can uh, watch it. Yeah, and uh, as I yeah. said, all, all I need is just the mods for the board, and I'll 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 get it done, and then I'll place uh, the order, and uh, I'm I'm going to be placing an order for a lot a lot bigger board. It's about that big. You can't really see it by hands. It's about the board's about that big, mm -hmm. and get five of them done, and it's about uh, it's about fifteen bucks to get large, quite large boards done. You know, it's uh, these guys. They're they're so cheap to get boards done. Yeah, I thought you were restricted to something like I don't know, five inches on a side. It looks like not. It looks like you can go bigger if you want to. No, but it's it it Think increases the cost anyway. if you if you do a uh, oh, one hundred yeah, centimeter sure. by hundred centimeter. It's two bucks to get five boards, plus you pay about uh, three mm -hmm. or four bucks shipping. So it comes out of about six bucks total. But if you go in a much larger board size, you go up to say two or 300 millimeters by two or 300 millimeters, the cost like maybe, you know, goes up by five. You're paying about 10 or 12 bucks for like five boards to get the bigger boards, right? That's still cheap. Two bucks, which is still yeah. cheap, right? Yes. Which is still cheap. But uh, once we got everything finalized, we can uh, we'll make an announcement, and uh, we could probably we'll post something on the Sorx group and get people to reply. Yes, I'll take a board or I'll take a kit or whatever. I'd really like to see if we get enough people. I'd like to see us uh, do a, a, an in-person build-a-thon. We haven't done one for years. That'll be fun. Yeah. 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 And, you know, some of the less experienced people, uh, they'll probably appreciate it doing it uh, in person because the help is right there on the spot. We, uh, we had talked about doing this uh, through Jitsi. Um, it'll work somewhat, but there's still going to be some issues. Where a build-a-thon, in-person build-a-thon would be a lot better. Yeah. Um, the church is still available. Um, I think Dave has uh, brought up the fact that he could uh, talk to his wife about uh, getting a party room at one of the condos that they deal with. Uh, it all depends. There's Eric's farm. Because we, uh, yeah, typically on field day, we do our own field day thing, and that's another thing we should uh, maybe talk about because it's kind of fun going up there and doing our own little field day event there. Um, we experiment, we do things, it's kind of fun. So maybe we could even roll that into uh, the uh, build a thon. We could build, build it, and then we've got lots of antennas, we could get their radios on the air. And listen to uh, to field day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the last field day that I worked with Park was 
far as they're concerned, a waste of time. That's why uh, we've decided to uh, do it on our own. We're going to do it at Eric's farm. And everybody's welcome to join in. Yeah, we'll make it Some fun. Of us. Because the, the last time, Ken, it was fun. And actually, uh, Hassan came out, and he got, got on the radio for the first time. He made his yep. first contact. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We could have a couple of stations set up to operate, and uh, I know I'd like to operate some. Uh, Eric will uh, probably Peter some, and then there's going to be people who just want to, you know, maybe work on the DCR. Yeah, <laughs> I've built enough of them. I'm not building any more. <laughs> no, I just, I just uh, you know what I think. I'll Operating to me is I. I just there's no fun. I'd rather melt solder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like to do both. I like I like field day. It's fun. You know, I've been doing it with Eric for the last uh, four in-person field days. And it was a lot of fun. The last one was kind of spoiled by some other people, but we won't get into that. But uh, yeah. That, that'll be coming up in June. And uh, Eric, Eric is uh, uh, voluntold that it's going to be held at his farm. <laughs> I think he, he enjoys it. And I think uh, Sandy enjoys uh, seeing some of our faces up there, too. <laughs> It'd be a lot of fun. Because we get anyways, uh, we get we get Eric out of the house and out of her hair. So, yeah, <laughs> things we kind of keep them busy, right? Yeah. Oh, shut up! Eric. Oh, Eric's back. Yeah, Eric's there. Yeah. <laughs> Those who can operate, do they solder instead? Yeah, well, at least some of us have a Canadian license. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Dave. Uh. Is this mic on yet? Not needed in V2 land. <laughs> uh, anyway. well, Eric, you should uh, uh, you should post a message when you're going to be uh, firing up your station, so we can kind of listen and tell us what frequency. I guess you're going to be it's going to be at 20 meters, right? Sandy's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, don't you have headphones on? <laughs> don't you have headphones on? Silly. So are you gonna are you gonna be going on twenty meters or what? Or you just see CW? Or are you gonna be doing phone? Are you serious? Oh, you wimp. You're going on about you're going to get your your an, Antigua license and, you know, you're going to go, oh, you wimp. I was looking forward to it. I, I thought, okay, I'll fire up my radio <laughs> and I'll see if I can hear him. And you're going to go torture him and buy some of his crap, right? <laughs> uh. Are you going to make me log into QRZ? Let's see who this person is. What was the call sign? Yeah, I got it up here. I got it up. It's uh, Lauren. Lauren Benjamin. Love What's to the call sign, Dave? This guy's definitely not uh, one of us. Oh, 
Well, here, let's, uh, I can, QR is pretty cool. I could zoom in and see where he is. Let's give me the as What's the call sign, Dave? What's that? What was the call sign? Uh, it is V21YA, V21 Yankee Alpha. Okay. Oh, you're in Tigua. If he is watching this, if he is watching this video on YouTube later, I I wonder what he will be thinking. He's <laughs> <laughs> weird. You're showing my home. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. He's in All Saints or Swindles or wherever. Who there's. Saint Sir Vivian Richards Cricket Grounds. So cool, Eric, you made a friend, eh? <coughs> Who knows if he'll, he'll be a, uh, a friend after this trip. Yeah, he'll, be, he'll be going, oh, what do you do? Do you want that? Do you need that? Can I buy that? <laughs> See if you can buy his antenna, uh, his tower, and take it home on the plane. Yeah, he, he texted me the other day, going, "Hey, you know what? Um, do you have a do you have a Alan Summers ten watt amp? Can I buy it from?" from from you and i said for what so it could die of uh loneliness on a shelf in the it's got to be built if i sell it to him he's got to build it yeah cruella no kidding <laughs> no kidding uh, all right <coughs> yeah oh, for what me. it's worth i should to show you this. This is um, where is it? This is the tiny SA. This little uh, forty-five dollar spectrum analyzer, and that's an FM signal coming out of my or an AM signal coming out of my signal generator. So I'm learning how to use this thing. Cool. And uh, there's a guy on there's a guy on uh, IMSAI guy. He he's got a whole bunch of videos, and I'm working my way through those. But he does a comparison between that and the uh, spectrum analyzer, so it makes you wonder. Well, you know, why did I, why did I spend nineteen hundred dollars on a signal generator if I can use this? But the other one's got to be better. <laughs> anyway, I'm learning how to use it, which will be, and I'm going to do a presentation on it eventually. Yeah, and I think Michael, I think you know the answer. You know, for something quick and yeah. dirty, yeah, it'll work. But if you want something precise. A little bit more precision. Yeah, you've got a good piece of equipment, you know, that you can trust. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, but it's interesting. It's interesting learning how to use this one and also the other one at the same time. So anyway, we'll talk you know, about that later. You know, what would be good for that tiny essay is if somehow they had that with a VGA or a HDMI port, which could take it and that screen. It could blow it up to a bigger screen. That would be nice feature. Because right now I find looking at a little tiny little screen to see mm -hmm. stuff, I, I, I can't. Uh, it doesn't work. work. Well, the one thing, the one thing they have, the one thing they do apparently have, is um, Anna has the same thing. It's software that you can run on your laptop, so you can you get a full size screen. On your laptop, just connect the uh, device, whatever it happens to be. And I, I, I know that exists for the tiny, but I haven't had a chance to look at it really. I'm just yeah, still see, trying to figure out the basics yeah. to use it. See, I would think that would be a really handy feature to have because then you could get a much bigger view of it. You could see the, you could see much more detail, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It, it there is there is something I just haven't had a chance to look at it yet properly i tried i tried to connect to it and it wouldn't work i don't know why but uh 
I'm going to take a look at that too. Because you guys, you guys haven't seen There's a couple of versions, and it works quite well. Uh, mm -hmm. My blog, I also got a post that on a uh, tracking generator I built for my tiny ESA. Oh yeah, look at the That'd look at the interesting. Look at the screen I use here. It's a TV. I took a TV and I'm using that as my monitor. I'm so blind. Sorry, mm. Dwayne. So that's interesting, Dwayne. You have a tracking generator that it works with. That, that'll be neat to try to build at some point. Uh, Michael, where did you buy that from? Um, I bought both my Nano VNA and this from R&L Electronics in the U.S. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, let's see, they they won't ship to Canada. So what what I used was cross-border pickups to get them here. Oh, okay. They're they're considered a suitable dealer. And out, especially I gather with the, with the uh, tiny SA because there's all kinds of clones out there and yeah and and likewise for nano VNA you got to be you got to be careful where you buy these things to make sure you don't get a brick exactly. or a, yeah. a crappy piece, you know uh, and that's so R and L why you asked R and the Apple sign L yeah hey hey Cherry are you planning to go to Dayton this year because I, there's, there's a yes. RNL yeah. and there's a whole bunch of other vendors. And if you're thinking of getting something like that, that's the place where you're going to get a deal. Oh, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah. I'm planning to go actually. Yep. I think, uh, yeah. Yeah. Be get sure to there. let, uh, to let Eric know. Well, if you, if you want to come and stay with us, um, be sure to, to let uh, Eric know to reserve a room because we've got a uh, Airbnb. I think it, it there's six rooms, five or six rooms. Yeah, I I, I plan to let him know. Yeah, yeah, I'll call him once uh, he he comes back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Eric, uh, you can uh, you know yeah one one for me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to pay. No, the, no. The bugs. Yeah. Don't don't bring your house pets. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, maybe three a.m. visitors though. Yeah, I don't want to know about his three a.m. visitors. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know who he gets to visit him at three a.m. You know. <laughs> is she is she going to be a ham at least? No, it's not. It's not a she I'm worried about. It's not a sheep. <laughs> it's a it. Uh, it may have sixteen legs, you know. <laughs> yeah, different species. Okay. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, we should probably call it a night. It's already nine thirty. Yeah. Yeah. So has anybody else got anything to bring up before we uh close up here? All right, I guess not. Okay, gentlemen, thanks for uh, joining in tonight. And